Christian Kopchow, or how you pronounce it, he's, he's not coming since he's uh, ill. And um, then I was asked if I could do something, and, and I said, yes, uh, I can do a talk about uh, how much aging affects tendon tissue or t connected tissue, and if we can do something about it. And um, I hope I can give you some, perhaps, some ideas or something that can say, or you can see that perhaps we can do something about the aging uh, of the aging tendon. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank some of the, my collaborators. Uh, I, for those who were here yesterday, uh, I, I can say that uh, yeah, Peter Magnusson, Rene Svensson, and Michael Kerr, and, and many others, PA God who's here and has uh, contributed a lot to, to these data here. So uh, first of all, we would like to just briefly go through the tendon, how it actually uh, is composed uh, in order to understand what's going on with, uh, with aging. And uh, the tendon is really regarded as a rope-like structure. So uh, beginning at uh, the top, uh, at the microscopic level, we have the whole tendon, then we come down to the fascicles, and then we come to the, the very smallest uh, functional unit, uh, that's the, the, the collagen fibers. Uh, these small fibers uh, we have here uh, contains a lot of uh, molecules, millions of molecules, but uh, we have to understand that these molecules do not go from one end of the tendon to the other end of the tendon. So something has to bind them to each uh, other in order for the force to go from one end to the other. So uh, there we have the, uh, the uh, sort of uh, what we call the crosslinks between the molecules and there are different kinds. And here's just a, um, a figure to, to illustrate how it, it sort of looked like. And we have um, the sort of lysyl oxidase derived uh, enzymatic crosslinks. Uh, they are derived from uh, the enzyme uh, lysyl oxidase, which are formed and, uh, during development and growth. But we also have uh, the sugar derived crosslink. And we can actually try and divide them into the bad guys and the good guys. And it more or less looks like that the sugar crosslink is the bad guy here in, uh, within the tendon, make, making it perhaps more brittle and, and more prone for injury, perhaps. I'll, I'll show you later. But the lysyl oxidase derived crosslink seems to be sort of the good guys that are regulated during training. Okay, so what is that we see with, with aging uh, of the connected tissue and collagen? Well, when there's a, there was a, a French chemist, a physician, 100 years ago, the Maillard, uh, Louis Maillard, he described this uh, very, very, I would say, a famous uh, reaction where when sugar comes into contact with protein, it creates uh, um, some, I would say, more complex reactions. And first you have the Amadori product, actually uh, uh, shown by an Italian also at the same time as him. And then, uh, then that actually creates what we could call advanced glycation in product on the collagen. And when there's another collagen molecule coming, passing by, that would create uh, what we call a crosslink, a sugar crosslink. And since it's uh, a covalent binding, it's a very, very strong uh, anatomic uh, binding. And what we see by aging is that in different tissue, it ac accumulates in different uh, rates. So like in uh, cartilage, we, we actually see that it, it accumulates much faster due to the turnover is much lower compared to like in skin. So that is actually uh, been sort of um, proposed of one of the mechanisms uh, for uh, perhaps the cartilage uh, degrades and perhaps uh, in the, by the end um, of the day uh, goes into what we call osteoarthritis. 
So what we also see here is that uh, disease, uh, lifestyle disease like uh, diabetes have some kind of infection that you cannot control sugar. So then it seems to accumulate much, much faster uh, around double fold compared to, to, um, to, to controls. And um, so that is kind of interesting because when you look at, uh, in, into uh, different animal models, it's been shown on t uh, tendon tissue level that it actually increases the stiffness quite well. And that actually means that the, the tissue as, as such will be much more brittle and much more prone because it cannot take up so much energy when it's very stiff. Here's just an illustration that different tissue accumulates uh, differently in, uh, with these uh, crosslinks, sugar crosslinks that cartilage have the, the highest accumulation compared to like uh, skeletal muscles only double fold. And bone also have to, to the, the capability to, to ac accumulate quite a lot. So maybe this mechanism, or it has been proposed that this mechanism might be behind that we by age, here is for lung and then here is for, for aorta, that we actually increase the stiffness or we lose elasticity by age. However, when we look at uh, tendon, and here's a, a study by, um, by one from uh, Narici's uh, group in, in England. Uh, Marco Narici has done a, a lot of uh, studies in, within aging, but he looked uh, together with Onambele Gladys Onambele, uh, they look into a, a group of uh, elderly and middle-aged and young men. For what, and what you can see here is that it actually is the, the reverse what we would, would have expect, expected. They put on an ultrasound on the Achilles tendon and then they could sort of test a, a force deformation. And what you see actually that the elderly is more compliant than uh, the, the young uh, persons. So that was kind of a paradox for what we actually could expect uh, from what I already have told you. So that makes us uh, speculate that that could actually perhaps, what could that could actually be? And one of the things they didn't really control for in this study was actually the physical activity level. So maybe that we know that by age we lose uh, the activity level or we degrade or whatever you, you say that could have an influence on the data. So they were perhaps um, not that, um, uh, had, had lost some kind of strength and that can actually influence here. There's also some meteorological issue, but that's, uh, we can, that we can discuss another time with regards how do you measure and how they did it. But nevertheless, we took a group of uh, elderly uh, men, um, with a, well, I would say not sedentary, but a, a, a middle um, activity level. Uh, and uh, we uh, did some different uh, measurements. We took uh, MRI and measured their, their um, patella tendon. And uh, what we actually found was that, that uh, between the young and the elderly, because we matched them, of course, with young persons uh, with the same activity level, we could not find any difference uh, of the cross-sectional error in, in these two groups. And when we did uh, a mechanical um, testing of their tendon, here uh, you see our setup uh, with an uh, ultrasound just uh, in front of the patella tendon, and we have the rig uh, here around the um, just above the, the malevolence at the ankle, uh, we could uh, simultaneously measure force uh, and, and deformation uh, uh, and, and then by calculate the mechanical uh, properties. And what you can see here at the linear region uh, at this strain curve, there's no difference between the, the two groups. However, perhaps you could uh, argue that there might be something down in the toe region here uh, that there's some kind of more of a buffer when you are young in, in the tissue before it, it, it strains out, and thereby you can sort of avoid high peak forces in the tendon. 
but that's another story. But it was not uh, significant, I would say, even though it looks like there's a difference. So what we also did that uh, we actually took biopsies from the, the patella tendon and, um, and, and in order to sort of examine the, the cross-linking in, in the tissue. And uh, here we found that uh, with the ELISA oxidase, uh, I've got to say first that the collagen content was uh, around 35% lower in the elderly compared to the young persons. But then at the ELISA oxidase, the good guys cross-link were actually higher in the elderly. And we sort of speculate, what could that actually be? But there we think that it's actually uh, the, um, an effect of time. So they have sort of, uh, in that way, accumulated their good guys crosslink. But what we actually saw was that the, the, the sort of sugar-derived crosslink measured by the um, uh, a famous uh, biomarker of uh, the sugar crosslink, pendocidine, um, that was actually sevenfold higher in the, uh, in the patella tendon for the elderly compared to the young uh, persons. And that was sort of the first study really to show that there was actually uh, quite of a, a difference uh, between young and old. There's been some studies uh, also doing on biopsy level, but that's been on cadavers. And there we really don't know what's going on and what kind of activity level they actually got. But what we found uh, also kind of interesting was that in, within the young group, we saw that uh, there was a, a, this uh, linear relationship uh, between age and pendocity. In the, so uh, it looks like uh, that you actually accumulate these uh, crosslinks, uh, sugar crossing, in a quite a young of an age. Um, so uh, at what age do you actually age, <laughs> uh, you could say? So that's um, a little kind of, uh, yeah, interesting also. So we sort of put that, all the findings we, we, you just saw, we sort of tried to put it in together and try to understand what's going on. And since, for, to, in order to try to understand that, we put this little uh, figure up. And, and since we didn't find any difference between the young and old uh, for the, for the cross-sectional area of the tendon, um, we, uh, however, know that the, the fibrils in elderly is normally fewer and they are also uh, normally smaller. But since we have a lot more of these cross links going on, that was sort of the, the mechanism we thought that perhaps could sort of equalize the, 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 uh, the mechanical level for, for both groups, that, the, that the, the mechanical properties was equal for the two, two groups. So, so uh, maybe this uh, explanation could be the explanation also for that we by age, uh, especially with regards to a rotator cuff tears, we know that we accumulate, or by age we have more and more rotator cuff tears, uh, to say that when we reach around 70 uh, years of age, then we know that almost more than 80% of us actually have rotator cuff tears. Uh, so some will know and some will, don't know. We typically the story about uh, our granddad or uh, elderly person. Some was working in the garden and suddenly pop it. It there was something in the shoulder, and that's for sure uh, normally uh, actually a um, a rotator cuff tear. So perhaps the age cross thing making the tendon more brittle could be an explanation for this. But that's more pure speculation and maybe also for the Achilles tendon that we see also uh, by age, uh, we have more uh, Achilles tendon ruptures. However, uh, this mechanism, just to say that, the, that sugar come into contact with the protein, uh, creating these advanced glycation is actually also proposed as one of the major uh, mechanisms in, in, uh, in, in many uh, lifestyle diseases like diabetes and, and doing uh, disease in many of these organs in the body. So is there something we actually can do about uh, this? And maybe um, training, and, 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 and there has been many studies looking into, to, uh, for example, lifelong training, uh, the fact that we know that perhaps uh, master athletes uh, live longer, they are, uh, uh, they are in many ways uh, uh, younger uh, than their sedentary controls, 
and to some extent uh, yeah, as young as uh, uh, young people in, in many ways. So uh, there has been some study trying to explain that, and that, this is a Danish study back from the mid-90s uh, showing that if you uh, train rats uh, for a longer time or the whole lifespan, then you can actually show at the tendon level that uh, you actually get uh, a more uh, young tendon. It's not uh, that stiffening you, uh, you, you see uh, at that level, but then you'll get a more compliant tissue and perhaps a more a, a young tissue. But what about, what about at the human level? What's going on there? Yeah, we actually took a group of uh, master athletes. Uh, master athletes have been running for more, almost uh, 30 years from the most end, and uh, they have also uh, been running uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, typically around 50, more than 50 kilometers uh, a week. And what we actually demonstrated using MRI again to see how uh, the tendon looks like at the patella, for the patella tendon, we could actually demonstrate that the elderly uh, master, or that the master athletes had quite uh, higher uh, cross-sectional error compared to sedentary controls. And the sedentary controls were really matched as good as we, we could, uh, could do it to these master athletes in, in, in many ways. And, and somehow also uh, for the, the young athletes here was also had a little higher cross-sectional than the center control confirming earlier data. So that means that when you have actually a, 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 a tendon here uh, biomechanical tested by these elderly, we couldn't really sh see that there was uh, any differences between the, the groups uh, for the mechanical level. Uh, however, they might go into a direction of a more complied uh, uh, um, level, but it was not uh, significant. So, however, since we have these uh, higher cross-section error of the master athlete, that would mean the stress for a given force is much uh, lower, perhaps indicating that these master athletes, when they are um, uh, running or so, then they are much more, uh, they can sort of protect themselves against the uh, um, in impact compared to sedentary controls. So we also took biopsies for, uh, from these people. And what we actually demonstrated here is, was that the master athletes uh, actually also had a lower uh, density of these sugar crosslinks, indicating that they are to some degree younger uh, than their uh, sedentary uh, controls. Again, maybe in that way, making it less brittle compared to the sedentary uh, controls. So the question is, do we really need to do lifelong training or, or running? And uh, I showed you yesterday the, uh, some data on, uh, on the patella tender as well uh, on uh, the the um, jumper's knee study from Max Kongsko back in 2009, that perhaps you could actually do something uh, on a short-term level, uh, since he demonstrated uh, that by using a heavy slow resistance type of training, you could uh, at the same time increase the collagen content, but at the same time you would also be able to reduce the, the um, uh, the, the amount of these uh, sugar cross links by uh, around uh, uh, 23%. So there is hope out there to get the, the tendon younger if, uh, if you want to some degree. Uh, so you don't need maybe to, to run your whole life in order to get younger in the tissue. And just uh, uh, a little interesting thing was that we also did measure the, the, the skin uh, the, uh, with uh, this kind of equipment, uh, measure the skin, uh, the, how much you accumulate of these sugar crosslinks. And since we know that when you, you have the reaction with protein and sugar, that creates fluorescence in the skin. So by putting up ultraviolet light on the skin, you can actually have a reflection how much sugar you have accumulated in the skin, and that way you can say how old you actually are in the skin. And that has been demonstrated 
uh, to be associated with 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 many uh, diseases uh, uh, in the body, as I showed you before. So you could say that the skin is sort of a mirror of what's going on in many organs and tissues in the body. And here we actually demonstrate in the same uh, group, uh, uh, in the same study, that uh, at the, both at the young uh, and also the elderly train, they had a, a sort of a, a younger skin age. And that way you could explain, especially perhaps for, its, for, for the elderly that uh, uh, master athletes, that perhaps that's one of the reasons for they perhaps live longer and, and more healthy. So uh, now I'm going to give you uh, a little uh, um, insight of what we also have looked into, uh, but that's on the animal. I and mean, we heard the discussion yesterday how much you actually can, can translate uh, animal data into to humans. But I would argue that the, the, the animals actually can be sort of an indication uh, for, for, for what's perhaps going on in human, and that could be a sort of springboard in order to go into a human trial, of course. And what we uh, some years ago uh, speculated around was the idea that, that fat has been uh, for a long time regarded as uh, the bad boy doing a lot of bad things into uh, tendon uh, tissue. Uh, and uh, but then perhaps this Maillard reaction, I'm gonna show you a little later, that maybe that when you eat something which is, has been processed or highly heated, as you can see here, the, what we also call, call the, the browning effect, you actually induce these advanced glycation in products into, what, into uh, your meal. And in that way, that gives the taste, but that has also, also a consequence, consequence on the, on the, on the um, hell, um, for your, for your body when you do that. So uh, we know that, and that was the, 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 the former hypothesis, that the fat as such is, a, 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 is or when you get uh, obese, that's a bad thing. And there's uh, definitely a, a nice uh, systematic review by Jamie Guider from Jill Cook's group in Australia showing that if you have a higher uh, BMI uh, or waist circumference, uh, compared to uh, controls, uh, then you have a much higher risk of getting an, uh, in, a tendon injury compared to uh, those who are not fat. And that's been shown both uh, for the lower, but also for the upper extremity, indicating that for the upper extremity, uh, where you don't have the same forces uh, as perhaps down in the lower extremity, there might be more a, a systemic uh, uh, thing going on. So uh, we know that the central fat actually produces more uh, cytokines and that perhaps uh, gives the low information. So that was sort of the idea uh, for more going into to see what's going on in the, on the tendon tissue uh, uh, more mechanistically. But that's not much uh, data. The animal study is very inconclusive and some have been performed on weight bearing tissue which sort of can, mis uh, can give uh, the, some confounders when you are, want to talk about if there is a systemic uh, uh, thing go, uh, going on. So what we did we, uh, actually was we had access to a group of uh, mice uh, who had, had, fi had fi uh, high fat diet and wanted to just eat the, the regular uh, chow. And I must say that the regular chow is typically highly processed high heated uh, uh, food, and that way induces uh, um, perhaps these uh, cross things, which I'm gonna show you a little later. Uh, and what we actually found here was, uh, and we have to say that there were also APOE knockout mice, which makes them, uh, uh, some of them more prone to arteriosclerosis. But what you can see here is that those uh, who ate the, the head high fat diet, that's the, the red um, line here, the B6, the normal mice, they are less stiff than the, the, the others. And that was quite a surprise to us. We thought that it was the other way around, as I already told you. And 
Nevertheless, uh, we saw that within the obese mice, which uh, they gain around uh, 40%, higher or 50% higher weight than the others. This is perhaps a little more extreme just to show you. Uh, but nevertheless, the tissue in them was uh, quite more uh, uh, elastic. So this is just a scheme to show, show you that, that it's uh, quite higher weight we see in them. Okay, so we try to, to sort of speculate around what could that actually be? Uh, that the, those mice who ate the, the chow was more stiff, and perhaps when it was combined uh, with a knockout uh, mice that uh, were more prone to atherosclerosis, maybe that did uh, a, more, a little more stiffening. But then we sort of look into the literature, and there was actually some nice data from uh, Mount Sinai in uh, New York showing that uh, that when you have this myarex and then eat food. Uh, where it's which is more highly processed and giving this high browning effect, which is normally more tasty, uh, then that actually can induce uh, organ problems like um, for like the kidney and so. So that could, uh, in that way, that could be somehow of a um, a, a, a hypothesis for uh, what was going on in our data, and. And here I show you that uh, with some of uh, other uh, markers of cross-linking or advanced glycation end products, sorry, we actually measured both in the Achilles tendon but also in the tail tendon. And the tail tendon actually, I forgot to tell you that this was actually in the tail tendon, which is sort of representing systemic stiffening. Um, then uh, we also, of course, uh, looked into the Achilles tendon to see how much that has more of a functional impact on the, the tendon itself. We could actually see that for the high-fat diet and also uh, both in the tail tendon and the Achilles tendon, that was much, uh, that was much more lower um, in, in, in several of these uh, different advanced glycation end products. And interestingly, this one, the m mitoglycoside, is the, the marker of the very, um, uh, I would say, advanced sh sugar, which we know is a product, uh, or comes a product in corn syrup, uh, which is in, in, is in many products uh, uh, in, in, for example, ketchup and so on. I'll, I'll come back to that later. But what you can also see is that the accumulation is actually also dependent on the tissue itself, meaning that the Achilles tendon within these mice has a lot higher um, potential of accumulating uh, uh, the sugar compared to the tail tendon. And that was quite interesting. Uh, but I have to say, we were just to go back a little about the, the, the diet uh, itself, we, we, we were sort of uh, speculating why could it be that, that they accumulated uh, more uh, in, in the chow. And what I just told you a little about that, that you can see that the, how much of these cross links you have is much more, uh, or the advanced glycation in process is much more in the chow diet compared to the high, fi high fat diet. And we actually saw there was a correlation between uh, the um, the, uh, the content of advanced glycation end products and some of the mechanical uh, properties at the strain level here. So there might be something going on. But just to tell you that this mitoglycoside is in many ways, just to put things into perspective, that one of the explanations for what, that we see perhaps on a human level, see problems uh, with tendon tissue and perhaps diet, and there's not much out there, could be that uh, many of us, and we have never been eating so much sugar uh, in our, our generation as we are doing uh, now, and this type of sugar, high fructose corn syrup, uh, where there's much more of this mitoglycoside, which is 100 to 200 times more reactive than glucose, could be a, an explanation for some of the problems we see in, in some populations. So I, I, I think, especially with the, the, the mind, uh, or in mind of uh, Katja Heinemeyer's data, 
showing that the tendon is formed uh, or is fi it's finally formed at the age of 17 to 18 years old. And I think we should, when, especially when we are working with athletes and young athletes, we should consider perhaps this issue uh, when they are young, how much are they taken in of these types of uh, highly processed um, food and, and sugar that actually can have an impact in a, in a young age uh, and especially on the tendon level. So yeah, uh, this is just to, to show you, uh, this is uh, from a, a study in, uh, from uh, the group uh, in London who has looked very much into typically horse uh, tissue um, but it actually shows that a, a horse Achilles tendon also accumulates these advanced glycation end products much more than the extensors. I know this is a human uh, tendon, but it seems that it accumulates much more, uh, again, a double fold than, the, than compared to the extensors. And why is that? Why has nature made that? stupid thing that the, the tendons you really use to sort of come away, you could say. But, but perhaps uh, the reason for that is the tendon wants to be very stiff to some degree in order to transfer force uh, uh, very quick from the muscle to the bone. So, uh, so if you have too much compliancy and too much turnover, that makes the, perhaps the tendon more compliant. So in that way, you don't want to have too much turnover. So that could really be the the explanation for, 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 for this uh, phenomenon. So, so just to uh, the conclusion on the diet part, uh, uh, there's evidence for, for accumulation of ages in weight bearing Achilles tendon uh, and due to integer age risk diet. Uh, and, um, and that this suggests that the food related integral ages, AGs could potentially alter the tendon properties and re represent a risk factor in develop of tendon injuries. So I think uh, still we might do something about it by, we, by training both on the long-term level but also on the short-term level. We can, we can uh, decrease that amount of sugar and perhaps by thinking about what we are taking in, we can make the tendon tissue much less prone but we can also make it bigger in order to, to do uh, good training. So um, with that, I, um, I say... Uh, Thank you to uh, my co-workers, and yes, that was that. Um. <laughs> Any questions? No, not much, really. Well, I think we sort of covered most of it. Um, yesterday also in the talk with uh, Kevin Tipton and you can, of course, this is, there's no data yet as far as I know. There's, I think there's one Chinese study who tried to, to correlate the amount of AGs uh, uh, in order to say uh, how much injured, uh, how much more rotator cuff tear uh, you have. But uh, I think that study and I have, cannot show you right now, um, could sort of indicate that there's some kind of a relationship. But yeah, uh, just to say that since these data is, uh, is not correlated to, 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 to injuries, we cannot say it. it's actually those, who, uh, this explanation or this mechanism is the, the related to injury. So yeah. OK, I think. Uh, since you don't have any questions, and, and so uh, it was totally clear for all of you, and I think we um, maybe take a little uh, break. I cannot